Coming up this week on Kings of the Rings podcast, Dwayne Johnson, you've got a lot of splaining to do. What a wild couple weeks has been for WWE and the world of sports entertainment. I have a lot of thoughts, but obviously I can't do this by myself or else I would sound a little bit crazy. That's why Will Gray from Bot Spots and Chair Shots Podcast is joining me to try to make sense and make the math mathin for once in the last couple of weeks. So sit back, relax. It is episode 367 of Kings of the Rings podcast entitled Crossroads exclusively here on WrestleAttic Radio. And it starts right now. You know, you either die of a hero or you see yourself live long enough to become the Hulk Hogan. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Kings of the Rings podcast, the award nominated Kings of the Rings podcast, episode 367 Crossroads. I am your host, King Rick Rose. Unfortunately, we were not able to have a show last week. We had a little bit of a scheduling conflict. Somebody was a little bit under the weather, but actually it's a blessing in disguise because since the last time we bit on air, the wrestling world has absolutely lost its collective shit in more than one way. So I gotta find somebody who can make it make sense. I couldn't find anybody better than the host of Bots, Bots, and Chairs Cats podcast, member of Rivet City Radio. He is a chef by trade, a mark by choice, and a cancer survivor by the grace of God or whatever God that you pray for, who, if he's in the sky, on the ground, in the water, all around. Ladies and gentlemen, the Will Gray. How are you, sir? That was a, that was a hell of an intro. I've been working on that sir. for two weeks, I'm not going to lie. That gave me a run for my money, and my intros are something I pride myself on, and you just... <laughs> You, see, you have to step my game up now. That's all there it's is what to happens it. when I'm, I take showers. <laughs> Self-care is important. Uh, it's a great Wednesday night. I'm enjoying the night, relaxing, going to hang out with you, talk wrestling, watch some wrestling. And just uh, like you were saying, I'm just here for the ride, man. Yeah, we have a wild ride of shenanigans and, and things to, to get into uh for this entire show uh so initially when you were going to be on the show last week uh obviously i knew that you and a lot of your constituents for bot spots and chair scots chair shots and ribbon city radio were going to be a part of the fans in the stands of the royal rumble i know it's something that for <laughs> because you went to the royal rumble you couldn't speak on a microphone for a couple of days uh hence why we had to reschedule but now that you do have a voice back uh can you can you tell us a little bit about that experience if, if i remember correctly this is your first like big four event am i am i right this is my first rumble yeah. i've been to a summer slam okay. so that was cool um, going to the rumble though, was a completely hi Ty. It's good to see you, sir. Um, <laughs> it was the first time I've ever been to a show that had 50,000 people. Yeah. It's, it's different, like, isn't it? <laughs> I've been to big shows. I've been to small shows. I've been to mud shows. I've been to shows where there was more staff than fans in the seats. Okay. Um, but looking at it in that perspective of, big scheme of things to be in what is equivalent to a top 10 wwe show of all time i'm like holy crap it was otherworldly like your seats shook from how loud the crowd was and again i've been to you know tons of bonnaroos and big festivals but concerts aren't the same as a wrestling show and that crowd was electric i don't care what people say when they watched it the crowd was dead blah 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 like inside the building there was nothing but electricity for four and a half hours yeah now you went to a, to a crazy rumble um what even looking at the way that they structured the trap i was like wow there's more people here than an average race game anywho um but, <laughs> <laughs> but they, it's the first time in a long time tampa's seen that stadium sold out <laughs> yeah um but it, i i know looking at it from from a viewpoint of a computer screen i was like wow this looks very tokyo domus the way they set this up i was like wow it was a really creative design that that they did for this rumble but for, but for you um what was 
what was one of the, some of the big moments for the Rumble for you? I know what mine were, and a lot of them were in the Women's Rumble. Um, but what were some of the high spots for you? I would say I'll, I'll give you kind of like the the rough the rough draft of it. Uh, the Women's Rumble stole stole the show. Mm-hmm. I would say uh, Naomi Naomi slash Trinity's return was one of the bigger pops. Uh, Jordan Grace once and the music was a, a recurring issue and people have talked about it since where the entrance themes people weren't sure who it was until the names popped up yeah but jordan grace was one of those people as soon as i heard the sirens i immediately was like okay because i had been predicting from the show for a long time that there was going to be tna representation and then leading up to it i've i i was like jordan's gonna be there um so I was pretty excited about it when her music hit. I flipped my shit. That was where I lost my voice. One would assume. <laughs> um, I was really excited to have TNA representation with the belt in. too. Yeah, her coming out, being acknowledged as the Knockout Women's Champion, all of that. Um, the Fatal Four Way. A lot of people slept on the Fatal Four Way, and we'll get into some of the Roman talk here in a little bit. But to me, that Fatal Four Way slapped like. In my opinion, if you have four men in the match, 51% of that match needs to include all four men in that story. And they did a great job of including all four men in that story. So hats off to the producer. Hats off to all four performers. The men's rumble was mid as fuck. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was. <laughs> my, my, other, my last question for you before we move on from the rumble and all that crazy stuff. What was because I mean, I know Naomi's pop. I even popped in my own damn seat when Naomi's music hit. Like, I was like, wow, the concert's back. I was like, what a way to start the rumble! Like, what a like, whoever booked it, bravo, hats off to you. Um, because you couldn't get hotter than that unless Mercedes came back. Um, but or AJ Lee, which I was like, wow, they didn't even like they, I feel it surprised me she wasn't there to be honest. Yeah, I feel, but I also feel like, and this is my kind of tinfoil, you know, marky thing, I feel like. Triple H, if he is the one in charge, um, is still is holding something. Like I feel like he still has a couple of bullets in the chamber that he hasn't shot off yet, um, purposely. Uh, but be it as it may, what was the scene like when Jade showed up and did the spot with Nia? It was ridiculous watching her come out one. Like everybody immediately, that was one of the few pops where everybody immediately knew who it was. Cause that was her AEW uh, theme, correct? Absolutely. It was the only thing I think instead of saying a storm is coming, it said a storm is here at the beginning, kind of like in AEW, they changed. You think, you know me, they had to change the person who said those words. Yeah. Uh, so WWE changed a few words in it, then went to the music and it fucking popped dude. Everybody in the place was on their feet all 50,000 of us were just screaming at the top of our Mm -hmm. lungs. When she got in there, the showdown with uh, her and Bianca, just chef's kiss on the fact that they never actually put their hands on each other because that leaves so much open for interpretation later. Yes. Like it was so well put together again, like hats off to all the producers, all the the competitors. It was so good. Uh, Two years in a row, the women's rumble stole the show from the men's. Yeah. I mean, I I was almost screaming into a microphone here because I was watching with my friends on with everybody on Discord. Uh, She lifted Nia Jax like she was a loaf of bread. It was scary how strong she was. And like, we've seen Nia Jax lifted in the air before. Beth Phoenix did it and Beth was struggling. Really badly. <laughs> Beth was struggling. And Jay did it like it was her warm up at the gym. <laughs> it was No, she yeah. showed out. Like yeah. there was so much she did to display her strength, the way she handled herself, the and a lot of people, and this will be I'm not casting shade at the people who say this, but they were like, she looked rusty, she looked slow. And I was like, she looked like a green WWE worker, not a green worker but somebody who was new to the WWE system and that's okay. Yeah. She's still learning the WWE system. Yeah. Like still in the big scheme of things. Anyway, she's still green. She's only been wrestling for what? Four years. Yeah. She's only 31. That's ridiculous. People say you don't get good at wrestling till you're 30. You don't master it till you're 40. Yeah. Wrestling's like, prime Jade's is in still, 40. Yeah. Jade still has a long road and she's already this good. 
Yeah, it is. Oh, man. I want that T-shirt really badly, though. I'm not going to lie. That T-shirt looked a, phenomenal. One thing before we move to the Rumble, that's something WWE shit the bet on. And I'll be honest with you. We talked about it on Sunday. Mm-hmm. Every merch stand had different merch. Ooh. So you had to like touch every merch stand to really put an eye on everything. The Superstore, both Superstores were sold out of larges and extra larges by the time the show started. Damn. And then after the show, they put out like the winter shirts for Bailey and Cody. They put out the new Jade and Andrade shirts. Like they had some other like exclusive merch that dropped. But if you didn't stop at the merch stand on your way out, you missed it. You missed it. Mm. And because we had an exit out onto a ramp right beside our section, we missed the chance to see all of that uh, merch go up. Uh, WWE is notorious for that. I remember at WrestleMania 38 in Dallas, as soon as Cody appeared, every merch had a had a shirt. Mm-hmm. Like within seconds, like I turned around and I was like, "Is that a Cody shirt? Like, Where did he get that from?" Like, it was so very synonymous with that. But it, it is a shame that you weren't able to kind of venture through the arena uh, after the thing was over and you know get some of that merch. Because WWE is notorious for that for being like, "Oh yeah, by the way, we have shirts now," like out of the blue. What happened when the Shield yeah. made a reunion a um, couple years ago at Barclays Center? I bought like two Shield shirts. I was like, "Fucking you guys, you guys got me." <laughs> like, <laughs> That's what I said too. I was like, "It's a gotcha moment." Yeah. Because you'll leave one merch stand and be like, "Oh shit, they didn't have what I wanted, so I'll buy this instead." And then as you're walking to your seat, you pass two more merch stands that had shit that you wanted, yeah. and the forty dollar bill turns into a hundred fifty bucks <laughs> like three stands later because you finally get everything that you wanted. Yeah, it, it is. It is. It is crazy. So the Royal Rumble was a high of highs for WWE. Uh, in the last couple of weeks, on top of all the other things that came out, and then Friday happened. So let, let's let's paint the picture for you. I'm gonna open up with this silo here. Imagine, folks, put on your put on your hat. Imagine, folks, you're watching a Marvel movie, and you you're into the movie. Let's say it's Endgame. Okay, everybody's seen Endgame. It's one of the highest grossing movies of all time. Um, you're watching Endgame. All right, you get to the final climactic battle. It is Thanos. And, the, and his Dark Order and all of his millions versus all of the Avengers. They finally come back from the snap. Sorry if I spoiled it for you. It's almost five years old. Watch the damn movie. Anywho, so you, 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 <laughs> finally, you finally get to that moment, okay? Captain America says, Avengers assemble. And as right before they're about to charge to this climactic finish... They turn it the the show flips and it becomes the sinking of the Titanic. That's how I feel. Okay. That is how I feel at this very moment in time. So let, let, let's 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 start from start from the rumble. Cody wins the rumble. Not only does he win the rumble, he then points to the sign. By the way, all of you marks pointing to the sign as soon as Bailey pointed to the sign. Phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. It's one of the coolest shots I've ever seen. Um, He points to the sign. He gets all the stuff. He then points up to the rafters where Roman is in a suite and he's go and he says, you, I'm coming for you. Okay. Whole thing. Okay. This makes sense. We've all bought into it. It's great. All right. We're, we're talking kayfabe terms here. Monday comes around. Seth Rollins. A couple months ago, Seth Rollins says, Hey, Cody, you haven't made a decision yet, but you should choose me. You know, this is the title, you know, be be the champion of like a Flair and a Rhodes and all that stuff, even though that's not the same freaking title, but whatever. Um, you know, you know, you know, <laughs> make, <laughs> it's not. He's like, make your own legacy, yada, yada. And then Cody gives Seth the line that I've heard from a lot of women from time to time. I'll think about it. That just means no. In my opinion. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. No, 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 no. He sir. said, I'll think about no. it. Maybes aren't, maybes are much better than no's. Mm. I would much rather have a maybe than a, like, and maybe I'm just too po- overly optimistic in my late 30s. I'm a little jaded. I, am, I understand that. So, yeah. You know, like, glass half full, brother. I, I, I like, get that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, a maybe I, is okay <laughs> in, in our late 30s. <laughs> Fair. Fair. When you put it in that context, all right, fair. <laughs> I still, th- I still, in my heart of hearts, I thought it was a no. So 
Seb goes, Seb tries to make his point talking about like, you know, do you want to be, do you want to be the workhorse? Do you want to be the guy that blah, 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 but doesn't show up and depends his title when he wants. Like, you know, this, this is the true championship, blah, 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 blah. Friday comes because Cody says, I'm going to show up on Friday and I'm going to make my decision. Friday comes around. Roman Reigns. For about 10 minutes straight. Obliterates any validity of equality for the World Heavyweight Championship to the WWE Undisputed Universal Championship. It is an absolute verbal annihilation. And Seth had a great argument. But Roman just obliterated everything that he that Seth was trying to build. And I don't know if it was personal <laughs> or something. Like, I thought they were friends, but I don't know what Seth did to piss Roman off. But that was, an, that was a verbal annihilation. And, like, in kayfabe, I can never see that world title as anything again. As anything equal to the WWE Championship. Probably by design, but still, damn, Roman. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he gave it to him. <laughs> yeah, I was like, this, this, this sounds like it came from a very sore place. Um, My personal favorite line from the whole promo was when he told Seth that you can't be the face of this place if you've been walking around in your wife's clothes for the last three years. <laughs> I was like, damn, Roman. Damn. Yeah, you had that. You said yes. He said, yeah, I, I work ten times less than you, but I also make ten times more money than you. How can you be the workhorse champion when you broke your back three months into defending the title? He's like, haven't I beat everybody that you, t- everybody that you tried to the, to defend that title against? I was like, Jesus Christ! And so here's the kicker: Cody comes out then and says, "You know what, Roman?" And for all intents and purposes, he goes, "You're right." He he says in much more eloquent words, "I agree with you, Roman." which is just a double down on the burial of this very beautiful World Heavyweight Championship. He says, I agree with you. This is the title I want. This is what I need to do. This is what I've been working these last two years for. And I'm coming for that title, but not at WrestleMania. And then he goes, I've been seeking counsel from people. And out comes Dwayne, The Rock Johnson, they have one of the most awkward handshakes and eye contacts I've ever seen between between two performers. And then and then Cody walks away. Cody walks off, and you have The Rock and Roman staring each other eye to eye as SmackDown goes off the air. And that's when the world started to burn on the in the IWC for, for many, many different reasons. So for yeah, right there from what we have right here and right now, Will Gray, what were your thoughts on that whole build and story before we start going into the you know minutia of it? But what were your thoughts on everything that occurred specifically, or more especially more on SmackDown? To be completely honest, Friday night I was at a show. Uh, I was running camera and production for Pro Wrestling Alliance. No free shout outs. Um, when I was there, I got a bunch of texts. They were like, oh shit. Like, you know, they were kind of blowing up group messages. I'm sure you're in more than a few for the wrestling community. And it's like yeah. when big stuff happens, like those, your phone just starts blowing up. Yeah. So I'm like, okay. I look, I'm like, oh shit, you know, The Rock showed up, what happened? So we leave the show, and as we're driving back, we turn SmackDown on. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh shit, okay. And to be completely honest, I said in the car ride on Friday, I was like, this smells heavily of a work. Mm. Um, Because I say this all the time on Bodge Spots, and I I proudly declare it, I'm a retired fuckboy. Um, (laughs) I know how to say some shit to make you think something's going to happen when you know something else is going to happen. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like slide a hand, like get you to look over here while I'm doing something over here. Like, yeah, that's what that felt like right off the rip, because at the core of it, Cody didn't say anything at the core of it. The rock literally never said said nothing. Yeah. said absolutely. Yes. But that was kind of the way I felt about it. I was like, the IWC went up in a roar all because he said, 
but it's not going to be at WrestleMania. He didn't say anything else. He didn't make a decision 100% that it won't be WrestleMania. All he said was it might not be WrestleMania. Yeah. And then the world collectively shit the bed. And I was like, I feel like this is like at some level, but I have been wearing a tinfoil hat since 1997. (laughs) And I've always said that Montreal was a work. So to me, I said right off the rip, this smells like a work. This feels like a work. They're trying to build Cody to be this larger than life baby face. And I don't, I don't like baby face champions. Mm. What happens when a dog catches the car, man? Like they're much better chasing it than they are driving it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's how I feel about baby face champions. They're spending all this time to build Cody up. They're going to make him larger than life champions. And when he does get that title, then what? Yeah. What happens when he finishes his story? Does the American nightmare have, you know, a 1,468 day reign under his belt? Does he have, you know, something that's going to upstand to what the bloodline just did over the last four years? I'm a Cody Road enthusiast here. I like the American nightmare. He won me over. But to me, like, it better be fucking worth it, man. What the bloodline has done, what Heyman has done, and Roman and the Usos and the Sami Zayn stuff, like, Cody better have his big boy bridges on and pull up his business socks because once he takes the the reins and he takes that belt, like he better be ready to run with it. Yeah, it is. It is the plight of the um of the baby face. I mean, mm-hmm. case in point, remember Dean Ambrose's championship run? Oh, yep. Up in flames. They couldn't get that title off of him quicker. <laughs> um, and that's what I'm saying. Yeah. I don't want that to be the case. I don't want whoever to dethrones Roman to be a transitional champion. And I wholeheartedly, I wrote about it in AEW. I said, I'm glad he had the clause that he wouldn't write himself into the world title because I wasn't ready for the reign of the American nightmare. I'm ready now. I just hope that he's ready. And more importantly, Triple H and WWE are ready Mm -hmm. to have Cody Rhodes be the face of their company. Yeah. It's so here's the, here's a couple of crazy thoughts for me uh, as well. Uh, With the backlash in particular, uh, on, on social media, all cross social media, we hashtag we won Cody was trending for over the entire weekend, higher than the Grammys, which happened. Fuck Taylor Swift, by the way. Um, <laughs> higher than higher than the Super Bowl, anything Super Bowl related. It was the number one trend worldwide. Okay, you had pretty big deal. Yeah, that's a pretty big deal. You had. Professional football players, George Kittle in particular, commenting about this angle during during um, Super Bowl media day. Okay, they were specifically asked about what was going on. George Kittle had a great answer too. Um, look it up. You know, um, the video that WWE put out on YouTube is the most disliked video. <laughs> In the history of WWE videos put on YouTube, the last number I heard, and it might be bigger, is over 600,000 dislikes. As a mid sized streamer and writer, <laughs> yeah, 600,000 dislikes yeah. would fucking bury me. I would <laughs> yeah. never get back out of that hole. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, God, I wouldn't know what to do if I woke up and there were 400,000 notifications that were like, yeah, Will, you shit the bed on that episode. Like, no way. I wouldn't, I wouldn't handle it mentally. I wouldn't know what to do. I'd, I'd retire. Yeah, and, uh, as Mark Henry put it when he was on Busted Over in radio, he goes, that's like six AT&T stadiums full of people because you can only dislike a video once, <laughs> you know, <Yeah. laughs> you know. And I don't think I've ever heard of any group of fandoms collectively saying, nah, this isn't it. Um, Even AEW fans are like, man, this wasn't the move. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this wasn't the one, guys. <laughs> so, like, it's in a kayfabe form, um, as as I'll take from uh, Suplex Media Guy on TikTok, he's a great guy and should probably be on our show. Um He's on botch bots on Sundays. Yeah, I, should, I should, I should, you should, I should throw, throw, throw me a bone a little bit. Um, anywho, uh, or I can just reach out. I just target him on TikTok. I would be more than, I, I will definitely make that happen. I think you guys would vibe real well together yeah. in all seriousness. Michael's a great guy. Yeah. So suplex media put it perfectly. Me and you, Will Gray are what we would call patrons of the art of wrestling. 
Okay. That sounds so eloquent when you say that. I appreciate that yeah. because most of the time I look at myself as a drunkard with a typewriter. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, it didn't come from me. It came from Suplex Media. But we are patrons of the art of wrestling. You know, we see wrestling as an art form. I mean, I also see therapy as an art form, but that's another thing. So we are kind of prone to look at wrestling as an art. There are different ways of doing it, but you you appreciate the art of it. When you appreciate the art of something, we're not really focused on the money or the drawing power. You just want to see good art. Like, you know, you don't go to an, you don't go to like the, um, you don't go to an art museum and talk about the expensive, like how expensive a Monet is. You just appreciate it for what it is. So when you are, when you're in, when you're a patron of the art, you know, of wrestling and you, and a company tells you for years, multiple years at this point, we are building this guy. This is our guy. Here's our guy. He is the next in line. We have him as the cover athlete of our, of our premier video game. That same damn week he was on Fallon by himself, by the way. He was on Fallon. He's doing all the talk shows, shaking hands, kissing babies. He's got his own damn chalk. He bought the freaking dog to the to the show. Okay, Farrell doesn't. It is a pretty dog. Yeah, Farrell's amazing. Farrell's a very pretty dog. Farrell doesn't show up for anything, especially after the fiasco that happened at AEW um, with the with the pyro and whatnot. Um, and then all of a sudden, the last minute, you say, "Nah, you know what? We're just not going to." It feels. As a person who is a patron of the art, it feels like a slap in the face of all that we have dedicated our, our time to. And there's also the other thing is that even though we are patrons of the art of wrestling, there are people who will tune in uh, and and wrestling is also a business as well. And WWE, for decades at this point, has been a publicly traded company. And one thing you have to understand is that a publicly traded company... It's only loyalty is to the people who own the shares of the company and they need to be, and you need to make the shareholders happy. And the only way you make shareholders happy in a publicly traded company is that you make them more money than what they've invested into. In that standpoint, from a business standpoint, yes, the rock is the bigger draw. Yes. He's going to to produce more money just because his name is there and he's affiliated with it. That's just the status that Dwayne the Rock Johnson has. You know, so like I mean when you look when when you look at that map, yes, it makes sense. But my counter would to that would be you want to make this a big thing. You've already established that Cody is your big thing. You've also already established that WrestleMania is about to break every record known to man in WrestleMania history. It's already breaking records, and the show hasn't even started. You know, it was like the fastest, the highest grossing. It's the highest grossing WrestleMania of all time in a show, and nothing was announced. Okay. Yeah, didn't even have a, a, a know, card yet, and it broke records. At what point does this start to become greed? And we lose sense of the art of wrestling. I, I love God, Ricky. God, I love that you worded it that way. I'm, I'm on a roll. I've, I've, I've had some thoughts the last couple of weeks. <laughs> Dude, you've got me cooking. I start. I got my notebook out. I started taking notes, so I was prepared for this because I was like, I think I know where he's going, and you set me up just perfectly. <laughs> First thing I wrote down was loyalty to the shareholders, man. And when you said that, you're absolutely right. Publicly traded company since 2002. All of the, the that wording made me come too tie. Thank you. <laughs> um, the the problem with that is with its loyalty to the shareholders. Okay, WWE 1,000 percent now as a company lives and dies by their views and their clicks. You see it every week. They talk about so-and-so had the most viewed YouTube video, blah, blah, blah. Even this week, you mentioned the dislikes on the video. They're living and dying by their social media output. Mm -hmm. That that goes – and then you said um, – and, so, and Suplex's video as well, and you mentioned it. Uh, the The appeal to the masses instead of like – 
the appeal for the hardcore wrestling fans, right? Yeah. WWE isn't appealing to the hardcore wrestling fans anymore. It wants to appeal to the masses because you tie it back in to those views and clicks. That's why fucking Logan Paul is wearing the U.S. title right now. Mm -hmm. It's a huge publicity stunt because he can work. He's a decent wrestler. The longer he holds that belt and the more he has to talk on the mic, the more exposed he becomes because you see how green he truly is. Correct. Then you look at the fact that it's not appealing to hardcore wrestling fans. And this one was a tough pill to swallow for me. And this is the truth in the matter. WWE is no longer a wrestling show. WWE is a television show about pro wrestlers. Mm. The way they write their stories are different. The way they cut their promos are different. Everything about the way the WWE operates, they're not a traditional pro wrestling show anymore in any capacity. And that's not a slight towards them. I've said in a lot of ways, it's like elevated up because of the, the detail that they put into it. But if you watch WWE because you want traditional pro wrestling, this is the point where a lot of people realize like that might not be for them anymore because WWE isn't for the hardcore wrestling fans. They're going for the masses. They want 5 million viewers to watch because they don't, it's all about clicks and views because they're a publicly traded company. Yeah, it is. It's, it's, it's scary. And us as, as uh as as patrons of the art of wrestling i'm thinking i'm gonna use that a lot more um and and this whole this the rock roman cody situation is also a thing that really exposes who is a patron of the art of wrestling and who is a person that watches wrestling because there are some people on podcasts who are patrons of the art of wrestling and there are some people who do podcasts who just are people who watch wrestling and there is a huge huge difference and it's getting exposed and it's kind of interesting to see uh I, you know i'll i'll definitely say that um but as as a patron of the art of wrestling people who watch this program for the art and the style of wrestling it feels like a gut punch it feels like i'm in an abusive relationship where i was told i was breadcrumbed all of these things for so long but it's going to happen all of a sudden you know we're just we just got to take this l and take this punch um and the problem is, like somebody who's been in the like not myself, but as you know, if you're a person in a really bad abuse relationship, a lot of the times you just take it and you just stay. And that is the mindset that WWE's kind of working on. They're on work on the mindset, and rightfully so, because it's happy because it continues to happen year in and year out. We can do whatever we want and they will never leave. <laughs> that's 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 what it is. We can do whatever we want and they will never leave. And I know that, you know, yeah. this is, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt it's you, fine. but this is why, this is why, Yeah. because they know those diehard pro wrestling fans. When you look at the big scheme of things, they're like, are we worried about losing those 400 to 600,000 diehard wrestling fans or the fact that every week, you know, uh, 500, 600,000 people see Logan Paul on YouTube. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, they're not worried about diehard fans because they're churning out these, I'll call them social media drones, where it's just the fact that it's like whatever's red hot in that moment, instant gratification, like give us what, it, like that's what WWE has mastered. They've mastered the art of instant gratification. And now that they did it, and I said this a thousand times. If they went to that well one too many times, it wouldn't be there anymore. It would be dried up. And this may have been it. They waited too long to do it. And now it's like if they don't correct and show us, okay, this was all a work. Cody's always been the one to do it. Then, like, they may have shit the bed with a four-year-long story with Roman and the bloodline. Yeah, it, it, it's bad. There, There's... um. My friend, I was talking about this with my friend because I I too didn't watch this live. I had I had someone, I had a friend over, and we were watching movies and stuff. We we're watching people murder people. You know, it's all that stuff you do on a Friday. Um, Makes and sense. stuff. So I watched it Saturday morning, and then I, while I was eating my brunch, I had to call my friend. I go, I need to talk to you right now. Like it was that level of distraught. Um, <laughs> and he's a rock fan. He's like, this feels bad. Um, <laughs> you know. He put it so eloquently. He said it is a course over correction. It is one of those things where if you look at the grand scheme of what happened, the Royal Rumble happened, 
your 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 supposed night one main event is shattered because Punk destroyed his tries. Destroyed his triceps. You have something else that we're going to talk about in a second. And then you have you have somebody who is a big name who just got a lot of power and thirty million dollars, by the way. Um <laughs> <laughs> no, as a part of the agreement, thinking that they needed to do this to quote unquote save WrestleMania, something that was already going to break records to begin with before he was even affiliated with the event. It feels like they were doing a lot of crisis management that was not needed. And there's also obviously the idea that they want to cast a wide net. They want to make as much money as possible because WrestleMania, and I've said it for years on this show, WrestleMania is not for the wrestling fan. It never has been. It never will be. Look back at WrestleMania 1. You had freaking Liberace. Okay. It is not for the wrestling fan. It's it's for the masses. Yeah. And I, I, I get that. Um, And I was talking about this a little bit earlier. I had a conversation with that same friend. I get they want to cast the wide net, and hopefully some of those people who watch WrestleMania will end up staying and become wrestling fans. But you know the best way to get somebody who's not a fan of something to actually be a fan of something? It's the people that are already a fan of something telling them by word of mouth how great this is. And my worry is if you piss off that core audience and they say... Hey, I heard Rock and Roman are doing this thing at WrestleMania. Should I watch it? If you have, if your fans are pissed off enough, they'll say, "Don't fucking bother," and that's what's going to hurt them if this gets pretty bad. And ironically, the Swifties might be involved too. So there's that. Um, I'll just drop that little nugget as well. So WWE is 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 walking a really tight rope between how long can we push this before we piss up our core audience, before our core core audience starts to turn on us and hurts our potential to make more money. They are they are walking a really, really tight rope here. Um, and they've got to fix it really, really quickly because, because less than 24 hours from the recording of this show, they have a WrestleMania kickoff press conference happening from las vegas i'm on i am personally myself on wwe's uh email list i take a lot of surveys for them as well because i am a fan of the product so i figured that my input should mean something i get a lot of random surveys from them it's actually pretty nice um as part of their email they highlight the fact that roman and rock are going to face off at this press conference. They're very coy about whether there's a match that's actually going on. Uh, Michael Cole on Monday also skirted around the topic. Michael Cole mentioned that everybody's been talking about the controversy that happened on Friday. What Roman, what Cody did on Friday, he never actually fully explains it, which is by design, but also very interesting wording coming from the lead announcer of WWE for the past some odd years. The fact that he can't just say it um, in and of itself, you know, so there is a lot of things I could boil down. This may not happen. Hopefully The Rock actually opens his mouth and says something, because that's what we need to hear from. We need to hear from Dwayne, you know, and Dwayne, Dwayne needs to say something positive, because we all know what happened with him and Oprah and the Hawaii thing. Like, it's been real bad for Dwayne publicly a little bit lately. Um, he needs a redemption tour. Yeah, he, he, like, he had the Oprah and he had Black Adam. Black Adam was was what it was, <laughs> you know, like, he, we need some goodwill. The UFL was a great start, <laughs> you know. The board thing seem, could be biting him in the ass a little bit right now because this screams nepotism, this screams Hogan, this screams what Hogan did to Brett, at WrestleMania 8, WrestleMania 9. You know, it just looks so bad for him. And it's it screams greed, it screams, you know, it screams cockiness, it screams ego. And so they've got, something's got to be great here. So what are your predictions? I have a wild prediction for here for this kickoff show, which I'll, I'll be watching because I'm a glutton for punishment, um, but I'll be watching. But Will Gray, what are your predictions for, for this, for this kickoff show? All the people on the, on the screen are going to be there. You got Roman, Rock, uh, Rhea, Bianca, Seth, and Cody are going to be there in, in this free show, by the way, it's a free to the public. It's going to happen. So what do you think is going to happen? Uh, 
I'm going to start with your last statement. Free to the public is very relative. Uh, they were selling press packs I for got that email too. <laughs> and $2,500 to be part of a VIP experience. To get reserved then, seating. <laughs> and then one step above that, they actually invited members of the media. Yeah. Um, WWE, as much as it sucks, again, as a mid-sized writer, um, like all they care about are YouTube and TikTok and your likes and the algorithm. And again, I feel like I'm, you know, beating a dead horse or whatever analogy you want to use here. But WWE lives and breathes the life of social media. If your following isn't where they want it to be on the their preferred social media brands, then they don't want anything to do with you. And that's tough. So, you know, that being said, going as a fan, my wild prediction is they're going to continue to bread what did you say? Bread, bread crumbing. Crumb bread crumbing, yes. Yeah, they're going to bread crumb us. I had to say it slowly in my head for a second. It's okay. Um, <laughs> they're going to continue to bread crumb us because this is going to be the longest 60 day burn we've ever seen in our lives. Because I still stand by the fact that they never said anything on Friday night, they never said anything on Monday. Exactly. I feel like there's still a lot to uncover here. And I don't feel like. This will be any of the definitives that we need answers to. This will be another opportunity for them to continue telling us what's going to end up happening. And I still stand by the fact that I think it'll be Cody and Roman at WrestleMania. Yeah, I mean, Rock posted on Instagram, on social media, about something about long game. Uh, Cody had a cryptic thing talking about, you know, uh, pizza is technically a cake, and in that case, pineapple goes on pizza. And I had to read it a couple times to get what the hell he was actually saying, which makes me believe that he's in on the stick too, because I saw his face Friday. I'm like, that guy looks defeated. Like, he looked so visibly upset. As a person who's been trained to read body language, I was like, that guy does not look happy in any way, shape, or form. And if he got me, he got me. Kudos to him. Um, you know, there, there is the thought that he's trying, that they're trying to make code, like you said, this mega star kind of reinvent uh, the yes movement or Kofi mania in and of itself. Um, my 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 counter to that is that Daniel Bryan and Kofi Kingston during those epic runs were never deliberately positioned by the company as the person. Okay, the company has told the story of Cody being the guy for the last two years. They didn't do it with Kofi. They begrudgingly did it with Daniel Bryan. Like, begrudgingly did it with Daniel Bryan. So that's the difference. There, You know, when Kofi, Kofi was a giant surprise to everybody, Daniel Bryan was what we wanted, but not what the company wanted. And they tried their hardest until they had to give in, you know. But with Cody, they told us Cody's the guy. Cody's the guy. Cody's the guy. Cody's the guy. Until all of a sudden, like, nah, he's not. You know, and that's what that's where the difference is. Cody was the established top your top baby face, and you're telling me your top baby face isn't gonna do it. Um, so this this could be all a giant swerve. They've written themselves creatively into a massive corner. Um and it it's some people like to do that. The, that's putting it lightly. Yeah, like like some some <laughs> writers like to do that. The Russo brothers who who directed Captain America: Winter Soldier and Infinity War and Endgame pub, has publicly said we'd love to write ourselves into a corner to see how we can get out of it. Be it as it may, this is a really shit corner. <laughs> like this is a really bad corner for, for them to be in with so little time to course correct. Like they they thought yeah. they they thought they had a double edged sword. They were like. You know, worst case scenario, we have to pick between Cody and Rock, right? But they didn't get that because they presented it like it was a realistic option. Everybody shit the bed and hated the idea of it. Now they're like, okay, maybe it's, but maybe we don't have two options and we only have one. Yeah. You know, because I think they thought just a little bit that they had two realistic options here and everybody's staggering reaction to the rock says otherwise and if they decide to go with the rock over cody like it might not be reversible no it, it may not be i i have a i actually before all of this went down i, I talked about this i fantasy i put my tinfoil hat and i fantasy booked how this should go and in my and i sound like adam blompier like do it better wwe which i probably am at this point um but all, <laughs> all that being said 
Here's the big, outside of all of this happening for what could happen in the ring, I think there's a bigger story here with the WWE kickoff and press conference. And I, I'm, I'll put it this way. Will Gray, don't you find it funny that they're doing a press conference for WrestleMania 40 in Philadelphia? They're having the press conference in Las Vegas. Of all places, you would think they would do a kickoff press conference like they've done years past in the host city. Why the hell are they doing it almost on the opposite side of America? Well, I'll tell you why, because my bold prediction for this press conference is that WrestleMania 41 is coming to Las Vegas. That's why it's there. On top of the fact that it's the Super Bowl and WWE just loves the shit on the NFL. Look at, if you look at Super Bowl sites compared to WWE sites, they're pretty similar within one to two years of each other. And this is the ultimate, this is WWE's ultimate FU NFL. We're as big as you by holding a presser at the Super Bowl host city and saying, by the way, we're coming next year. I think that's what, I think that's why it's in Vegas among all of the things. It's very UFC. But UFC also does it in the city where we're hosting it at. Um, so I think that's the big thing to take away. Of anything that's going to be definitive, I'm saying WrestleMania 41 is going to Vegas. What are your thoughts on that, Will Gray? You pretty much knocked that out of the park with that prediction because Nashville as a city has all but been told as long as the stadium is up and functional by 2027, we're getting a WrestleMania and a Super Bowl. Yeah. So, like... You're a thousand percent spot on with their competing, their their comp set in their market is 100 percent the Super Bowls for WrestleManias. And being on their radar with Nashville, I can confirm as a resident, they're saying things like if the stadium's up, we're getting both and possibly an NFL draft in like 18 months of each other. Listen, you guys had a pretty dope NFL draft year, but one time it happened. They did it on Broadway. you say that, but I was working on <laughs> God, dude. I was working in the Gulch. I was six blocks from downtown. It was a madhouse, bro. I would never wish that on my biggest enemy. <laughs> I'm also glad I'm not in a kitchen anymore for when it comes back. Yeah. Um, but I think you're absolutely right. I think Vegas makes sense to be out there for the time of year. Vegas in April would be gorgeous. And do you think about you know, the slight shade that it would be because AEW goes out there every year for double or nothing. Mm -hmm, But they Um, they don't do it at Allegiant Stadium. No, 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 absolutely not. But it's like WWE going to Vegas and booking Vegas in their biggest stadium. Like, I like it. Even if they're not throwing shade, I still think it's a little bit of those old school, like territory things. We're going to run in your town, but book the bigger venue. Mm -hmm. Like, I love that shit about pro wrestling. So I'm I'm here for it. Plus, it'll keep things busy until they get to Nashville. Yeah, yeah, that, that's 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 what I think is going to happen. Be it as man, we have all of this controversy going on um, with The Rock, Roman, and Cody, and and then you obviously have this kickoff of what's going to happen here, what's going to happen there, and WWE as a corporate entity probably thinks that their fans aren't doesn't don't have the intellect enough to think of two things at the same time because this is a clear example of crisis management it's a clear example of look at the shiny thing over here look at this while something else is going on the underhand and that's something else that they want you to forget about is vincent kennedy mcmahon and brock lesnar by association by the way we didn't get a chance to talk about it last week we're not going to talk about it too much this week um as most people know <laughs> Uh, Vincent Kennedy McMahon is a vile human being, and the court papers. What? <laughs> yeah, you don't say. Yeah, and the court papers kind of the the allegations they are under allegations currently right now. Uh, kind of say the same thing in very vile ways, and and I'll I'll say this, you know, kind of right now. Uh, as I mentioned before, I've studied. I I work in the field of mental health, um, and psychology and therapy and stuff, and I've dealt personally uh in my line of work with a lot of people who have been abuse victims i've had romantic relationships outside of work with people who have been abused and and i've heard of stuff from a lot of my my friends uh or people who have had those experiences in my personal life um and what i read was textbook abuse um 
textbook narcissism textbook a lot of stuff but to an extent that was that disgusted me and made me question a lot of my fandom to the to the organization that this guy created because like it or not you cannot separate the artist from the art you know he you know he created the thing that we you know that we love the most but it, you know he's still going to be about legacy but it it was scary to me the stuff that came out. Um, it was it was heartbreaking to me because I've I've seen what that does to people. Um, you know, I I I was lucky enough the same day that it came out. I did in a I was requested by an all women's podcast down for the down for the count podcast as they know of my expertise to go on their show um and and talk about it from a from a very mental health and psychological perspective uh to the best of my ability uh they were very appreciative and i and i will always thank them for for allowing me to do that in a in a space where i felt like i had no i had no business being in but they were very appreciative of me coming on the show so please check out that podcast if you can um but it really did change the perception going into the rumble um, and going into Mania Week and this dropped like a bombshell. And then you have all this stuff going on um, with The Rock and Roman Conan. And it makes you think that we are trying to forget about this. And I'm here to say I haven't forgot about it at all. Especially since last week, the FBI is getting involved. <laughs> okay. The, <laughs> the, federal, <laughs> the federal government is looking into these allegations and also looking into the past allegations because Vincent Mann has at least one or two allegations of for every for the past 30 or some odd years. Sable had one. Um you know um and they're 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 trying to really it's not looking good for this man. Um if you even want to call him a man at this point. Uh so so it's not looking good for him. Um, but I think that's there's that that has to be a huge reason why WWE is doing all of this stuff and getting our trying to get your minds off of it. But I'm telling you right now, we haven't forgot and we are smarter than you think. Um, so, yeah, like I said, we're not going to focus too much on this. I've said a lot what I said on Down for the Count Wrestling Podcast, and I want to give them the rub and you should go check them out because we went almost like two and a half hours talking about that. But, Will Gray, I know I was fortunate enough to send you all that information when it came out. You know, uh, and and the lawsuit. I I know you probably combed through it or read through it, but what are what were your thoughts on it? I think at the core of everything, this is about the the victims in place being okay. Yes. Um. This is much bigger than wrestling. This is much bigger than WWE or AEW. When you look at the kind of allegations that are made and the charges that are being brought forward, even as allegations. These are big, like yes. these aren't like I'm. And again, like I'm, I'm Mister Separate Art from Character. I've had you know episodes dedicated to Lord Voldemort. It doesn't <laughs> bother me. I'm, I'm okay with it in most cases. But this is one of those like, this is yucky. Beyond, I, I say we don't yuck any yums. And I finally found a yum that I'll yuck, and that's Vince McMahon because even as allegations. If only some of this is still true, he is still a vile human being. Yeah. Even if the smallest percentages of what was said are true, he still doesn't need to be in power. He doesn't need to be around anybody else. He definitely doesn't need to be have subordinates that are female of any capacity. Like this man does not need to be in charge of anyone moving forward because you go all the way back to 1983 and read a Chatterton. Uh, and what did Cat Williams always say? Nobody accuses you of the same shit for 30 years and it not be true. Yeah. Shout out to Cat Williams sending it home for 2024. <laughs> <laughs> he did. He brought the heat right off the bat. Listen, we got Cat Williams. We got uh, Jay-Z at the Grammys <laughs> this past Sunday. Monique did Uncle Shay Shay. Monique's coming with some heat lately. I saw that the other day. Um so yeah, it's a year to be alive, man. Twenty twenty four is only six what weeks old. What a year! What a year to be alive. It's so true. Um. So so yeah, and and the crazy thing about it, it's getting swept on obviously the Vince stuff and the you know look here and stuff. And the one thing I do want to mention before we move on is that let's say Rock and Roman does actually occur. It's it overshadows the fact. Hey, Sammy, it overshadows the fact that um two men of color will main event 
a night of WrestleMania, which should have always been the big story or one of the biggest stories. I'm saying two men of color because The Rock is Samoan, Roman Samoan. Even though The Rock is black, he does not identify as black. He identifies as Samoan, similar similar to how Barack Obama is mixed race, but he identifies as black. That's what I'm. That's why I'm saying person of color or men of color, um, because there have been two people of color and they were African American women, Sasha Banks. Bianca Belair, who main event of the night of WrestleMania. But it's, you know, it's something in such a white male dominated field that has been pro wrestling for so long that this should be one of the bigger stories going into Mania if it were done in a way that we would have liked. Agreed. A thousand percent. Yeah. As some, no, Sammy, thank you. You're the first to tell me I'm beautiful today. I love you. <laughs> Good to see you. Um, you said it best. You're absolutely right. Looking at the situation in hand. Um, shit, I lost my train of thought. See, Sammy blew my mind. <laughs> Ricky, Ricky, start over. She she got me all flustered. That doesn't happen. Repeat the last thing you pretty said much, to me now. I'm pretty sorry. much what I said is that it, the fact that two men of color are, have the possibility of headlining and main eventing a night of WrestleMania is being overshadowed by the wave that... Thank you, Sammy. Uh, it's being overshadowed... <laughs> by the way that that story has come to fruition. You're absolutely, yes. A thousand percent, I agree. That I think that, one, when I first heard that statistic that this was the first time, I, in my head, was like, that can't possibly be true. And then I started looking. I was like, it's 2024, and that's absolutely fucking true. Um, I feel like that in the conspiracy theory world a lot of people will say the government does things to distract us from what's actually happening mm -hmm. and that's 100 percent what wwe is doing it and if they use this as the ploy as the distraction it's almost like they're phoning it in they are you know what i mean like it feels like it downplays what it should be and the meaning it should have and all of that it almost feels like that they're phoning it in because they know it'll be like, oh, that's going to be a huge pop, rock and Roman. Like, yeah, but it's almost like they're they're only using it because they have to now. Yeah. They've got all this shit from the Vince saga going down, and then they're like, oh, shit, what can we do to cover it up? What's the only thing bigger than that? Rock and Roman. Yeah. And I don't feel like this is a you should use it because you have to use it. Like, you should use it to celebrate it. Yeah. You know? They had the perfect thing. You, you they had they, they did it on the perfect month. It's Black History Month. Like this like the, this could have been written into the fabric of WWE doing something good or doing something that's long overdue. Like the like Becky and Ronda and Charlotte main eventing WrestleMania. This could have been really woven into what WWE does as a sign of goodwill, as a sign that they are, you know, progressing in part of the times and it backfired because they emphasized the wrong thing <laughs> you know and they got to they got to where they wanted to go in the wrong way and honestly it's the rock's fault if the rock were in shape and not having a scheduling conflict we would have had this in hollywood which was the better place for yeah. it anyways come on people were saying at 38 and then everybody was like no, no rock roman in hollywood makes sense yeah and now that we're at 40 it's like uh wait what <laughs> and again i used the analogy earlier they went to the well one too many times and now it might not be what they wanted or what they expected yeah but it is some, but it but there is one thing that we did expect and that we did like is that they actually did bailey they did bailey justice <laughs> the the she finally got her roses. yes the 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 most davina rose it, exactly um the most forgotten of the four horsewomen Year in, year out for her entire career, Bailey, the you know the redheaded stepchild. Um, and by the way, congratulations, Sammy. Apparently, yay! <laughs> I just found that out. <laughs> <laughs> Woohoo! That's a first for the show. All right, we got a got a baby <laughs> announcement. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> but yeah, um, Bailey, talk about everything actually going right for the women. In WWE, they played the story perfectly. They set it up. They actually, they actually stuck to the easiest answer is the correct answer instead of muddying the waters like they've been doing with Roman and Rock and Cody. This was the easy answer. This was the just answer. It was executed perfectly. Bailey, out of nowhere, speaking Japanese in the middle of a show, 
shocked me. I was like, who taught her this? <laughs> you know? Um, yeah, I loved that. Yeah. I popped a little bit for the Japanese. Yeah. And this, as of right now, is the only solidified match of WrestleMania week so far. It's the price of admission for me. I'm always going to be here for for Bailey to to have a big moment, and she's finally going to get that one on one big moment. And if we bring back the wacky, wavy, inflatable arm failing tube men, I'm going to lose my shit. It's going to be great. What are your thoughts on this, Will Gray? If she goes all the way back to hug her Bailey, I'll be a little bit surprised by that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I like babyface Bailey. I think going back a little bit was a good move. Um, I like the call where she wore the same style of gear from when they debuted at SummerSlam last year. Oh, I didn't notice that. Good call. And then wearing the all white gear again the other night when the turn happened. All of that is like perfect textbook wrestling storytelling right after I get done ragging them for not doing good. (laughs) They did one thing right. (laughs) But they at least got this right. Bailey deserved this a couple years ago. And then they gave it to. I think it was the Urea one and then Bianca. And then you is like every year you're like, this is Bailey's chance. And then somebody kind of usurps it and takes that role. And Bianca deserved it. And Becky deserved it. And Rhea deserved it. And then finally it's like Bailey's chance and Bailey's taking it. And it looks like she's running with it. So I'm excited to see what she does with this. And I think the story of the, the demise of damage control was the right call to make here. Yeah, no, absolutely. She, 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 she did what she needed to do. Bailey, did what she was supposed to do. She she cre- she essentially created the strongest all women's faction of all time. Oh, agree. You, you know, oh, yeah. by by every metric that I I can't name three other all women's factions in the history of pro wrestling. I can't. <laughs> you know, no. You, you know, so she did something rare. She did something unique that will go down in the annals of time. Of you know, a group that she that is totally formidable in every metric. Like there's there's Hall of Famers all up, up across that up up and down that list, and then there's Dakota Kai. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> someone has to have a shit end of the stick sometimes. That's only because she's injured a lot. Um, you know, but she, she did. This is a great story for Bailey. I'm really excited for this. I, I'm excited for her to get her moment. Um, and she deserves Paramore. She deserves Paramore. And she wants Paramore to perform her entrance. Screw it. Let's do it. If we're, if we're you, it would be a step up. Yeah. What was the dude's name last year? Hardy, the guy who should have met at the Royal Rumble. <laughs> yeah, like come on, it can't be any worse than that dude. And I'm from Nashville. I can say that. Like, if you're gonna do bad, like rock if you're gonna do bad rock country at least be good at bad rock country but he sucked at yeah, it he was like bad. you can't be bad at bad rock country he was <laughs> bad oh my god that was terrible <laughs> exactly um so you yeah, know congratulations to that i'm looking forward to see what they do with that uh as it continues uh, speaking of which, we had some shakeups. Unfortunately, or fortunately for some people, we lost Kevin Patrick. Kevin Patrick was fired immediately. Um, like as soon as I came out, he was he was gone. And I, I kind of feel bad for him, but it's one of those things where he just didn't click. He he wasn't what they wanted him to be, and I understand that. Um, and so so they let him go. But we got Pat back. <laughs> Pat McAfee and Michael Cole are full time on Raw. Uh, SmackDown goes to Corey Graves as the lead and Wade Barrett as his color, um, which so far has been an interesting pairing. And then we obviously still have Vic Joseph and Booker T, even though Booker T has been out for undisclosed reasons, uh, but you still have that pairing, which I which I thoroughly enjoy. So for you, Will Gray, uh, what do you think of these these new teams that are that are part of the uh, the Raw and SmackDown? Uh, shows. I don't have anything against KP. I, I like him. Okay, he was fine. Um, he's not. He's not as bad as Adnan Verk. You remember Adnan Verk? Oh, Adnan just didn't MLB. get it. He was so much better on MLB 2K the show. <laughs> yeah, he just could. He didn't know the product. But yeah. KP is kind of the same way. He came into it without being a wrestling person. He adapted some, but he just never really got it. Yeah, and there's nothing wrong with that. Wrestling's a weird. You can't be. You can't be a broadcast person anywhere else in the world and expect to be able to make it work with wrestling. Again, you have to have that little bit of a mind. And I think as a commentator, if you're not a fan of the product, you're going to have trouble like 
getting over the way you're supposed to. And that, that might be just a bias with me, but I think if you're going to be a color commentator and you don't know the product, it's going to be hard for you to do it. Um, the other side of it is Pat McAfee has been a lifelong wrestling fan and that man is fucking electric. <laughs> he is like, ridiculous. I don't care. Him and Michael Cole together are golden michael cole finally won me over 30 years into his career <laughs> is, I'll say it, i'm a michael cole guy now but him and pat together are awesome pat has that loose cannon of being able to get in the ring and run around and be wild but he can also sit back and actually do the job the successes of the Pat McAfee show. He shows you that he can keep up with the news and run everything and put together a viable option that clicks and views. Again, I love that I keep going back to that, but he's one of those people where you've got a million people tuning in to watch his YouTube stream a, a couple times a week. Now WWE gets to take that and translate those eyes and views into eyes on Raw. Yeah. So great move. Puzzle pieces in place. WWE plays chess while every other wrestling business is playing checkers. Not only that, you know where the Pat McAfee show is going to be live from tomorrow morning? Tell me. Las I'm Vegas. Oh, no. <laughs> what? Exactly. What? Las Vegas. Who would have thought? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Who would have thought? He's going live from Vegas. That is going to be... You know how many eyes are going to be on that presser now? Because Pat McAfee is going to, going to bolster that just for being on for three hours on ESPN tomorrow afternoon. Yep. It's going to be absolutely nuts. Don't be surprised if Stephen A. Smith and first take her from Vegas, too, because um, that's going to happen as well. You know, so so it, it's it's interesting times. Um, I mean, I so far I like Corey and Wade because they're the thing with Corey and Wade, which is different from Pat and Cole, is that these are two guys who had varying success in WWE. Corey's got cut way too short, but that wasn't that was just his shit luck. But he was able to propel it into a career. At one point, Wade Baird was gonna be the new top heel guy, and then you know. John Cena and the Nexus happened, um, but <laughs> you know, um, so so these are guys who, which I think makes a SmackDown product very very interesting. Now is that you have two pro wrestlers, two sports entertainers who know the product from all these varying aspects, now providing commentary on what you see on screen. It's it's a and like. The, the cool thing about it is Corey Graves no longer has to be sh has to be a crazy heel. And Wade Barrett just has to kind of just be himself. And it kind of works so far. It's an interesting way of, of doing things. Uh, but moving along to a brand that really doesn't really have that much controversy. NXT Vengeance Day happened. Okay. A, a show and a product that I think all of us as wrestling fans were like, oh, wow, all of this makes sense. Who knew? Shawn Michaels. Um, put, put together put together a Sunny Days-like performance with NXT Vengeance Day. The big thing coming out of it was the fact that we had a heel turning heel because he was truly a heel to begin with. Carmelo Hayes whooped that trick all over Clark was it Clarksville, Tennessee, where they were at Clarksville, Clarksville, Tennessee, Clarksville, Tennessee to end the show. The, the classic NXT lower third coming up and then the beatdown happened. He broke a steel chair over his knee like, like Jesus Christ. Um, what a moment. Also, great match by Trick and Ilya. They really played it. Anger. They really played it yeah. up. And whew, that finish. The running at each other? <laughs> Who's going to get their move off first? Ah, oh, beautiful. Um, we have Mello and Trick. Where where does this... I have an idea of where this goes, because I don't think Mello stays around for much longer after Mania. But where does this go, uh, Will Gray? I think this is building to... Obviously going to be Mello and Trick at Stand and Deliver. Yeah. Uh, maybe maybe even shake everything up and put it in the mid card on day one or day two. Like that's how big this story has gotten. Both these guys have gotten ridiculous pops on the main roster. Tricks appears so on SmackDown the, like blew the roof off. Yeah, it did. So I don't think it would be even hard pressed to believe this being a big enough match to be on the mid card of one of the two days. Uh, but more than likely, I would say it goes to stand and deliver. Uh, I don't know if I think they'll tie 
the NXT title into it somehow. Um, I thought maybe Trick winning it and then the turn happening, building to stand and deliver for the title. But even without it, you don't need the NXT title. Trick Williams, Carmelo Hayes at stand and deliver could be your main event even without it, without the belt. I, I like the fact that you put that there is a possibility this could be, you know, night one or night two of WrestleMania, which, by the way, they just they just announced the start times that they bumped it up to like mm-hmm. 730. I think I got the email about that, but I find it. I found it interesting when watching Vengeance Day for the first time ever, the WrestleMania sign was at an NXT event. And it was huge. It was massive. It so big in that arena, <laughs> yeah. dude. So the WrestleMania sign was present at an NXT event, which does kind of lead me to believe, because you don't do that for no reason. Like, it leads me to believe that there is an NXT match that they want to put on WrestleMania. They've done it before. It was just during the pandemic. Charlotte Rhea was supposed to tear the roof off uh, in Tampa, but the but the pandemic happened. So an NXT title has been defended. An NXT match has been on a WrestleMania. It's just that there wasn't a crowd for it. But I think Carmelo and Trick works in the middle of WrestleMania. It's a perfect build. It's a great way to showcase your two big stars on a stage that they can just show out. I agree. You know, and it, it's the bis, it's the biggest story. It's the best story from NXT. And I think moving forward, you can take the best NXT story to put it put it on a WrestleMania every year to highlight NXT. Of course, obviously highlight the talents you have down there, but also highlight the people who you choose to to execute that best story on WrestleMania. I think it's a win-win, and I think that would be that's a perfect formula for NXT. You get the you, if you guys can make the best story, we can get you a WrestleMania spot. Agreed. That's a genius idea. Um, I thought about it, too, while you were talking. Adam Cole defended the NXT title at Survivor Series in 2019, which was a banger match against Pete Dunne. Mm-hmm. But even then, that was still a Survivor Series, not a WrestleMania. Oh, the Adam Cole World Tour that year was phenomenal. Him and Daniel Bryan yeah. on SmackDown, impromptu. Yeah. An impromptu match because of scheduling conflicts in Saudi Arabia, and they tore the house down. It's wild to me that some we got some of those matches at that point. Yeah. Um, but long and the short of it, you're absolutely right. They could they would absolutely own it. They would tear the house down um if they had a chance to go to WrestleMania and highlight it. Having NXT do it yearly, I don't think it needs to be said, Oh, if you're the best story, you'll get that WrestleMania spot. But I think once they set the precedent that if you can build that kind of a story to WrestleMania caliber then you can earn that spot. And I think that's more that's more important is showing these guys that you can build a story that's bigger than the developmental brand. Yeah. You know? And their their appearances on SmackDown approved that. You know, Agreed. the NXT SmackDown kind of working partnership that they've developed has doing wonders for both brands. It's right. SmackDown is truly the land of opportunity. Yay, Nick Aldis. Um moving on from there as well. Probably the wildest and unpredictable match in a great way was the women's title match. Lyra Valkyrie, Roxanne Perez, who Roxanne's going to just own NXT at, at the rate that she's going. And she's going to be there for a while because you got to slow burn Roxanne because she's 21 years old. <laughs> um, and then you had Lola Vice, who won me over, Will Gray, for the first time ever. Because like I wasn't a fan of Lola Vice, aesthetically, huge fan of Lola Vice. Um... <laughs> but in the ring i was like they say she's an mma fighter she just shakes her hips a lot which again aesthetically perfect great wonderful lovely on my tv um and then she went mma in the ring and i was like oh oh she's a fighter <laughs> it's like oh she knows what she's doing okay <laughs> um this outside of a main event um this was a very, I like the story they told. I like the craziness that they did. Uh, little Victoria, a.k.a. Tatum Paxley, because it's Victoria's daughter, uh, really has the cycle chick thing going down perfectly. Uh, this was just fun. Lyra Valkyria kind of survives <laughs> in, in, a, in a weird way. It's going to be interesting to see what her road is leading in the stand and deliver. Uh, but I, I enjoyed this. And even though Lola cashed in and lost, I think that's perfect for her. You showcase her, you see what she can do, 
and then you just build her back up again. And she she has something there, and I like it. But what did you what did you think about this match in particular? This is going to sound really terrible. Um, this match may have been the most forgettable on the card for me. Um, I it's not that I didn't Lyra Valkyria as an NXT Women's Champion. I've always been this running joke that she's like a baby Deanna Perazzo to me. Without like, the attitude? Yeah. Uh, when she dethroned Becky and she took that title, I don't want to say it's felt flat because she's had a few really great matches, but going from Becca Becky to Lyra did not feel like it went as well for me. And some of these women in NXT right now are bona fide stars. There's a few that are tearing it up. And then there are those few that came out of the NXT breakouts tournament that I still have trouble remembering which ones are which like the other day i was like is that victoria's daughter or is that santino's daughter oh uh, ariana like, grace versus is, tatum yeah you know what i mean like going back and forth and figuring out who is who coming out of that most recent class and that's no fault of the workers i feel like that's my fault probably for not paying more attention to nxt really yeah no i i definitely get that um big fan of ariana grace as well i'm like i see santino in her all the time I'm like, they gave her the perfect character. She's an obnoxious beauty pageant girl. I was like, this is going to be great. She's a, she's an oblivious, obnoxious beauty pageant girl. I was like, perfect. <laughs> Absolutely yeah, yeah. perfect. She, what scares me about um, what scares me about Ariana Grace, she has her father's facial expressions. <laughs> like, uh, all, I, all I see is Santino the entire time. I'm waiting for the day he shows up randomly and they do like a Cobra spot. Like, I just want to see a comedy uh, spot between him and his daughter, because I think that would be just, it would just be fun, to be completely honest. Or when they let her cut loose and pull it out and just let her use it for the one-off <laughs> just for fun. Exactly, yeah. Um, it, it is difficult. There, there's so many really talented women that could break out uh, from this class. Lash Legend, I think, is on the precipice of being the, a huge thing. Um, she lifted Otis, and I'm like, I'm sold. Like she body slammed Otis. Oh, yeah. I was like sold. When she scoop slammed <laughs> Otis, I was like, oh shit. Yeah. Like, okay. Yeah. And he he did it perfect. He posted up. He did everything to make it right for her. Mm-hmm. But for her to manhandle that grown ass meaty man the way she did, <laughs> I was like, okay, I see you. I see <laughs> yeah. what you're doing here. Yeah. And somebody that's gonna be on everybody's radar is definitely on my radar. Oba Femi. My how could he not be on your radar? My the size of a fucking skyscraper my lord sec's finest the first ever person from the from one of the nil classes to ever hold a championship in wwe and right fully so he throws grown men across the ring like it's nothing it is scary he's decent on the mic it's fine he'll get there if not they'll put a mouthpiece with him i he has, and I know it's kind of a cursed word at this point, but he has Brock Lesnar ceiling. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he has a Brock. Like, I see Obafemi. I see the rest of the talent rush. I'm like, we don't need Brock anymore. He can retire. WWE's fine without him. You know, and if you if you, if you you push Oba like I think they're going to do, like, he manhandled Dragley. Dragley was the golden boy a couple years ago. Their golden signing. He made him look like shit. <laughs> he annihilated him. Um, and that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to make new stars. Um, and Oba Femi, oh man, I am very excited for him. I am very, very excited for you, for him. What are your thoughts on Oba? I want them to make sure before they send him to the main roster that he's main roster ready. That's yes. my only question. He's came out of the gate swinging. Everything about what he's done has been rock solid. They're booking him like an attraction, even though he's on TV weekly, which is still cool that Sean's able to pull that off. It's very reminiscent of like Andre in the the late run of his career where you saw him all the time, yeah. but when he wrestled, it was still a big deal. Mm-hmm. That's almost like how Sean's handling this. Uh, so again, just hats off to Mr. Hickenbottom there for just knocking it out of the park because this guy went from being a was a basketball or football player, football player to football player to going to the performance center to getting signed in the NIL class to getting moved up to NXT almost immediately to being the number two champion in the promotion is like 
this guy's only been working for like 18 months. Yeah. And he's and like, you look at him. About yeah, that. and you look at him. He's yeah. still not he's still not in the best shape when you look at him. Which is crazy. No, he's still got some growing to do. Like yeah. not growing as the bigger, but like bulking up and like cutting back and like leaning it all up. He's gonna be a monster when it's all said and done. In another two years, he's gonna be unreal. It's gonna be Bobby Lashley on Omas's frame. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy coming from somebody who was who was an SEC football player. And those guys are usually just jacked and large. And you're just like, he can you can do more with him? <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> You, you really can. It's it, it's crazy. What a coming out party for Obafemi. I can't wait till he gets merch too. It's going to be really, really interesting. Um, and finally, last thing here. Um, we finally, Joe Gacy finally found a character that he's comfortable with. It's very CZW of him. He finally, you know, he finally has found, like, they hinted at it with the schism. You needed to break up the schism. GYV needed to leave. Ava became a GM. Good for Ava. Stop messing with Ava, by the way. Um, <laughs> Just, I want to put that out. Stop messing with her. Just throwing that out. Yeah, just throwing that out there. Stop messing with Ava. It's not her fault that Dwayne's Dwayne. Um, and... We finally got to see what I think is Joe Gacy's final form. This psychotic wrecking ball of a man um, that even in a loss, he still wins, smiling when he's getting knocked out or getting choked out. He's just, he's the new mind game guy. And I have enjoyed it. It is Big Mick Foley. It's Mick Foley. It's Bray Wyatt, blatantly Bray Wyatt. Um, and But he's putting his own psychotic spin on it. And this is one of the stories that Mr. Hickenbottom and the and the folks at NXT have built up really well because you didn't know what he was going to do week in and week out. And now you see it in this no DQ that he's just an unhinged person. And he he has the facial expressions. He has the man. It just works perfectly for him. Agreed. My biggest thing was when he started doing all the stuff on social media and started talking, I'm going to go back to my CCW ways. You don't know what I'm capable of Dijak. And he was posting with the crimson mask and he had such the, the color all over it. And I was like, all right, cool. He's going to go hardcore. The street match, the street fight's going to be ridiculous. It was very WWE street fight. And I think maybe I just got my hopes up a little bit more maybe. than I needed to. But with everything else you said down to, uh, it was last night on NXT where he slid out from underneath the ring and he had the fist on the end of the stick and he knocked the hijack out with it. Like, come on, dude. That kind of stuff is hilarious. Um, so I like the where Joe Gacy is going. I like everything. I was maybe just let down a little bit because when I hear street fight now, maybe I'm just conditioned to expect somebody to uh to bleed a little bit but it was wwe doing wwe things mm -hmm. dijak's a star gacy is a huge star and i think that uh they finally found some way to make it work um hopefully it'll stick better than moxley did when they switched him to ambrose because moxley couldn't adapt to the wwe way as ambrose and i think gacy may have figured out a way to adapt his czw character to fit wwe yeah uh, listen i like the, the legos on the legos on the on the table was a great spot because <laughs> it like it also fits his character like who brings Le no it wasn't legos it was toy cars sorry toy cars onto onto a onto a table and having dijack almost miss it by the way but go through it uh, <laughs> you know, at the end, before we, before we move on to, to the outro and the end and everything, cause this came to mind, I, for, I should have put up one of these screenshots, but there's been this weird promo about a man has three faces. It's very, I think it's a part of a Japanese proverb. Um, you know, one he shows to the world, one he shows to his family and one that no one ever sees, you know, but three face theory, it's been, it's something that has been quoted and replicated and used in many different aspects in different professions, especially in the psych profession, a bunch of times. And it keeps popping up on NXT. And then Vic Joseph and company just no sell it all the time. <laughs> like it just didn't happen. So your best prediction, Will Gray, who the hell is it? Two people. It's Okada or it's Julia. I feel like those are the only two options. They're leaning real heavy into the the Japanese side of it with the proverbs and stuff. So it would be one of those two major Japanese stars. It would either be Okada or it would be Julia mm -hmm. without a doubt. Julia, I know is it Japanese, but the connection to new Japan would be there if they needed it. I would say more than likely Okada is going to NXT. 
he's already TV ready. So they're just going to hone it in and make him WWE ready. Mm -hmm. And it'll be a dragon Lee style NXT run. He'll be there for maybe a year and then he'll be on the main roster next week. We'll see, you know, Kazuchka the weatherman or whatever. Like six months. It won't be a big deal. Yeah. So it's, here's the thing. If it is Okada, Stand and deliver becomes a sellout crowd. Without a doubt, a hundred percent. All right, because of, yes. of all the shows that happen, stand and deliver is usually the show that doesn't really sell so well. And granted, I get it, rightfully so. It's NXT, not the, the entire people that know him. But if you bring Okada into the mix and say he gets a match at stand and deliver, those tickets are going to skyrocket. That thing's going to be a must watch show. What would you think if Okada comes to NXT? And Shen goes down to work him at Stand and Deliver. Yes, thousand times yes. <laughs> you would you would you would be like, okay, I'm okay with Shen going back to NXT for this match. Yeah, he already did it before. He has. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not. When I say going back to NXT, I don't mean it derogatorily in any yeah. way. What I mean by that is him going to Stand and Deliver versus Shen being on the WrestleMania cards. You would be okay with that showcase match? Yeah, absolutely. 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 You that place is gonna be a madhouse if he shows up. Oh yeah. <laughs> you know. It, like I'm at this point, I'm waiting to hear for coin drop somewhere. I thought it was gonna happen at the rumble, to be honest, because the way I had they were an, talking had a feeling, about yeah. that the way they had been talking about everything leading up to that point, I was like, Are we gonna get it at the rumble? Or maybe after the rumble or something. Yeah. You know, the way we got punk right as the credits rolled. Maybe we hear the coins drop and he just walks out as the credit rolls. Honestly, but, they could they could have easily pivoted to if everything was right, they could have easily pivoted to Okada Seth. That would have been beautiful. That would be great. That would have been beautiful. Um Yes. You know, because I mean, it, it fills a, fills a lot of holes and a lot of gaps. <laughs> um, you know, because you don't you don't need Okada to get ready; he's already ready. <laughs> you know, that's what I mean. He's TV ready immediately. Mm-hmm. All they have to do is kind of tighten the bolts in a little bit for WWE. Yeah, that's all they yeah. have. To make do. sure he gets the right music. Make sure he gets the right you know entrance and stuff. You know, you, but you have sixty days to work that out. Bingo. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, Easy money. Easy money. But, you know, we'll, only time will tell. There's a lot that needs to be unfolded. And that concludes uh, the show this week, the wild, wild show uh, that it was this week. Thank you, Will Gray, obviously, for, for joining me finally um, and being on the show and talking about all the calamity that has been the last couple of weeks of WWE in particular. Um, you know, we're going to get the NTNA when we talked about on the pre-show and I am bet you Tony Khan has some major announcements that we forgot about that he's going to talk about very, very soon. It'll probably be uh, talked about next week. But before we leave out here, I do want to give you some time to promote anything that you want. Obviously shout out anybody you want. The floor is yours. First and foremost, Ricky, as always, I want to say thank you for uh, trading a home and home, coming over to my show. I'll come over Mm -hmm. yours anytime. I'm always down. We're going to do a jersey Um, swap at some point. (laughs) We we will. We'll we'll eventually meet up. If you're interested in my shenanigans elsewhere, if you check my link tree at The Will Gray, you'll find everything that I do for Rivet City Radio, Botch Bots and Chair Shots Off the Top Media, Creatia World. You can find my writing profile for Last Word on Sports. Um, that's pretty much it though. If you check anywhere on the internet, you do anything and you search for botch spots and share shots, you'll find us. Perfect. 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 And with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, let's get this show on the road. Cause we do have a post show to do. So without further ado, folks, ladies and gentlemen, you have been listening to Kings of the Rings podcast, episode number 367 crossroads, because a lot of people's IWC fandom is at a crossroads in the last couple of weeks of pro wrestling. I have been your host, King Ricky Rose. You can actually find me at Ambassador Biggs across all social media outlets, B I G Z in Bachelor Biggs. Find Kings of the Rings podcast at K O T R underscore podcast across all social media, like share, subscribe, leave us five star reviews. The link to all of that is in the description below, including some of our awesome merch. I'm wearing my, own king ricky rose merch because i am a little bit egotistical at times because i have my own merch store surprise surprise links all of that are in the description below. that's a true story too uh we are part of wrestle addict radio the cure for the common wrestling podcast network and find wrestle addict radio socials at addict underscore wrestle on twitter because i refuse to call it x and at wrestle addict radio all one word everywhere else on the socials like share subscribe leave us five star reviews all about hot stuff when we return when i return next week uh hopefully the world doesn't implode hopefully the press 
conference gets us some answers, probably not. Tony Khan has some major announcement that Fretz is going to reveal to us on the post show. Uh, we're going to figure it all out. Uh, I'm going to have a guess. It's it's. God, this is a weird time to be a wrestling It's amazing and such a weird time to be a wrestling fan. So until next week, folks, goodbye, good night. We'll see you soon. Stick around for the post show, Will Gray. And, um, oh, yeah, I forgot. Uh, fuck you, Slack. You'll never make it to Mania. See you, folks. This has been a Wrestle Attic Radio branded podcast.